Maggie, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me. Of course. I want to start off with my first question that I ask all of the guests. It's a little bit tricky and weird, but I am really excited to hear how you're going to answer it. How would you describe who you are and what you do to a person you just met at a party? That's a great question. Um, I, I feel like when you tell people you're a poet, <laughs> um, one of the things that they ask first is like, people do that? Or what else do you do? Um, so for many years, when people would ask, you know, so, sort of who I am and what I do, I would say, oh, you know, uh, I work from home, or I'm a writer, or um, I'm mostly parent, you know, I would sort of give the self deprecating answer. And a few years ago, I just decided to start owning it. So when people ask who I am and what I do, I say, I'm a poet. And if they have questions about it, um, I'm happy to answer them. But I think that encompasses so much of who I am, not just sort of how I make a living, but how I um, move through the world that it, it seems silly not to just say it. And I appreciate that. You know, I majored in poetry in college and I graduated many years ago, but even when I admit that to people, it does feel a little bit weird. You get laughs, you get questions, but I'm glad someone like you owns that title because you you deserve it. And it's a huge part of your identity. And I want to shift to talk about your book, Keep Moving. It has become my nightstand companion. I turn to it pretty much every night before bed just to help me calm down and feel good. But the book started as a daily ritual, a series of notes you posted on Twitter that all ended with the phrase, keep moving. And I want to ask you, what made you start doing this? What was the moment where you said, I am going to sit down and write these notes? And how did it feel when you started? You know, I was going through a really difficult divorce when I started writing these notes. And I didn't set out for it to be a book. Uh, I didn't even set out for it to be a daily practice. I just did it one day. You know, that's that's always how we start. We start with one one day at a time. And so one day in, I think, October of 2018, I wrote myself a little self-pep talk, really. And I ended that little self-pep talk with the words, keep moving, and posted it on Twitter, mostly uh, just to kind of come out as someone who is struggling, because I think one of the issues I have with social media is that we tend to curate those spaces in such a way that make us look like we have it together. Um, you know, like the background that you can see right now is fairly clean. What you can't see is the rest of my office. And there's a reason for that. And so uh, social media is a lot like that. We show the like corner of our life that is clean and um, palatable. And we take pictures when, you know, our eye under eye circles are camouflaged and um and we don't often post when we're struggling we don't post pictures of our you know sink full of dirty dishes and so posting these every day was my way of saying hey i see you i'm going through this stuff and maybe you're going through different stuff but we're all we're all in it and the response was such that it made me want to keep going um, with it it helped me to have a, a kind of daily positive intention during a really difficult time. But seeing other people who were either going through divorce or a death loss or a changed job, or, you know, this was pre 2020. So we had, um, we had pre pandemic concerns. Um, seeing how other people found reassurance or comfort or hope in these also helped motivate me to keep going. And that's really how it grew into, into a book. So that's what people asked for. You know, a lot of these notes, these pages in the book sound like conversations you had with yourself. And I know that when people go through a really tough time, a lot of the conversations they have with themselves are negative, are nasty, are mean. So how were you able to shift that tone and change the way you spoke to yourself and wrote these notes? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because we deserve the level of compassion we extend so easily to others. And, you know, if if my best friend or my sister or my neighbor had been going through what I was going through and came to me, I would have said, you are going to be fine. You have got this together. You're an amazing person. The future is so bright. I know you can't see it right now, but it's going to be okay. But that's not, unfortunately, often how we talk 
to ourselves. Our self-talk is uh, usually fairly unkind. And we tend to say, you know, things like, well, if you were a different kind of person, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Or what, what did you do? Or what could you have done differently? And that is not helpful. <laughs> so part of this project was trying to extend that level of compassion to myself and to be a little kinder and gentler to myself because ultimately I think the most important conversation we have every day is the one we have with ourselves, and um, it needs to be you know an honest conversation but also um, I think a compassionate and kind conversation yeah I agree and and you know as a writer do you feel like when you put the words down on paper they shift the thoughts in your brain you know is there any type of process like that that maybe other people out there once they get something on paper it changes how you feel did you notice that with these notes well I often don't know what I think until I write it down <laughs> so if I'm really struggling with an idea the easiest way for me and I say easy you know it's that's a little facetious because none of it's easy but the best way for me to process my thoughts is to put them on paper and I'm a I'm a handwriting person so I'm a pen to physical paper person I never actually learned how to type so my brain and these two little fingers that do the work it's not good um, so yeah I mean Part of, part of daily practice too, I think, is the repetition of the thing. If you say something kind to yourself once, it's really easy to let that go. But if you make a point of getting up every day and finding something good to set your intention for that day, it, I mean, what I found from experience, and I was pretty skeptical, um, I call myself in the book a recovering pessimist, um, what I found was that over time, it really did work to shift my thinking and that telling myself, you're going to be okay and look up and look around and these are the things that you still have and that are beautiful and you're, you're doing it. Telling myself that every day changed the way that I was thinking. It got me out of that old rut of a thought pattern, out of that old track and into and into a more open space. And, and even though I was skeptical, it, it worked. So I, I do think whether it's writing or whatever the thing is that helps people feel most like themselves when they're going through a hard time, you know, for me, processing on paper was helpful. Some people like to do their best thinking on a long distance run or on a road trip or while meditating or, you know, while um, walking their dog, I mean, whatever, or while sculpting, you know, whatever the thing is that helps you kind of clear the noise and get to that quiet, still place where you can really process what's happening, making space to do that every day if you can, I think, it can only do good things. Yeah. And I know that when you go through a difficult time, some of the first things that leave you are your passions, your hobbies, the things you love. You almost forget what those things even are. So, you know, in your experience and in other people's experiences, what are some ways that people can go back to what are those things that made them happy? Because I know when you're, when you're suffering and you're going through such a traumatic experience, you almost forget anything that makes you happy. So how do you even take that first step and start again? I remember taking a walk in my neighborhood on one of my worst days and just thinking, I don't know how to do this. Um, because when we go through big life changes, so much of what happens is we start to, we start to sort of reconsider or feel like we're losing our identity. You know, if you've always been a journalist and then you lose your job, then who are you? And if you've always been a wife and mother and something happens to your family, then who are you? Um, and so I remember taking a walk. I remember exactly where I was about a block from where I'm sitting right now and thinking, okay, I need to remind myself of who I am because I feel lost. And the thing that's going to help me is even if it's only 10 minutes doing something that reminds me who I am outside of this mess, because that's the thing when we, when we get sort of myopic um, and claustrophobic in our thinking, and all we can think about is the problem at hand, that capital P problem, um, we start to slip. And so I thought, okay, what small 
foothold can I find today that will make me feel like me, the me that predated this problem? Um, because, you know, when, if you lose your job, it's, I think, helpful to remember that you existed before that job. And when you lose your marriage, I think it's helpful to remember that you existed before that marriage. And so what is it that you can spend time doing that gets you back to yourself? And so I remember coming back from that walk and spending 10 or 15 minutes writing. I probably didn't get anything good, you know, out of that 15 minute session. I don't think I came and like wrote my next poem. There was no like great masterpiece that happened, but just simply the act of reminding myself who I am outside of the trouble was useful. And so I know it's hard. I mean, it's hard to find the motivation to do anything when we're really suffering and when we're depressed and anxious. Um, but sort of pulling ourselves up and doing like one small thing, like if you don't want to go for a run because you don't have the energy, like put on headphones and even if you want to listen to sad music, take a walk. You know, there's always a baby step, I think. I appreciate that because I think a lot of people think when they're down or they're just going through a tough time to get back to themselves, they have to go run that marathon. They have to write that next chapter of the book, but really it's taking that step. It's just doing one thing and being so proud of that tiny little thing. And another thing that I know I've personally struggled with that I'm curious to hear if you've had to deal with this too, is days, hours, even minutes where you have felt two polar opposite feelings in one, grief and joy. And I know that when I was going through something so traumatic, I felt so guilty feeling joyful, just even if it was for 30 seconds in that same minute. So what would you say to people who are going through a tough time and are feeling a little bit guilty or bad about feeling joy in these little pockets of their day? Yeah, I, I feel that deeply. Um, I, I understand the impulse and I think that this year in particular, we're all in that space where there's so much suffering and we want to acknowledge and need to acknowledge the suffering and the losses that people are experiencing, some of which I'm not at a place where I can fathom it yet. Um, and yet, this life is a one-off. This is all we get, as far as we know. Um, I suspect this is it. <laughs> so I, you know, I think I have been living, holding grief and loss in one hand and joy and gratitude in the other um, for a long time, but certainly for the past two years. And I often want to set the grief down, but that's not really how life works. We have to hold it. We learn how to shift maybe our the weight and carry it a little better, but we still have to carry it. It's, it stays with us. Um, I never want to put the joy down. I'm, I'm holding on very tightly and with that hand to the joy component of this, because that is what enables me to keep writing. It's what enables me to parent effectively. Um, you know, I knew really early on in this that if I wasn't going to be a functional human being, that my kids were not going to have a functional parent. And so, um, you know, I don't think that we should feel guilty about experiencing joy even in hard times and even this year in a collective hard time because we need it. That's part of what makes life worth living is not just gutting it out, but having things that we, um, you know, recognizing what we still have, I think is so important. And, you know, I, I think about, you know, when, when I lost my grandmother and how devastating that was, if I think about that, like she didn't want me to be sitting around, um, mourning for months on end. And there are moments when I miss her terribly and moments when I'm not thinking about it because I'm out having a snowball fight with my kids. And I think the people who, who love us and the people who have left us want the best for us um, and would like to see us living our lives as fully as possible. 
I, I appreciate that. And, you know, one of the things that I, I loved in the book is when you talk about how if you can go back and tell your younger self something, it would be to, be to be brave, practice bravery, even if you don't feel it. So what is it about this word bravery? Because it seems like it does factor into you being able to appreciate joy, even when you are going through grief. So what is it about that word? And why is that so important? Yeah, I mean, bravery and, and courage. I've been thinking a lot about like, what, what as a parent do I want to impart on my kids? Like if my kids grow up and they only are one thing because of my parenting, I would like that thing to be compassionate. But if I got a twofer, if I could choose two things that my children would grow up to be, it would be compassionate and courageous. And I, I don't mean courageous um, as in like superhero. <laughs> I mean like, uh, owning their lives, making decisions for themselves, fighting for the kinds of lives that they want to live, being bold, um, not being scared to try. You know, my little guy who just turned eight just made um, student council, right? So he's his second grade student council rep. And we were talking about it and he was so excited. And he said, were you on student council? And I said, no. And it's not because no one voted for me. It's because I never put myself out there because I was scared that no one would vote for me and then I would feel rejected. And it's, I'm so proud of him, not because he's the student council rep, but because he was just like, well, why not? Let's just go for it. And my daughter is, is often, you know, is the same way. Like she's not afraid to put herself out there. We often, um, we have a couple of mottos in our family, but one of them is why not? And I just think why not is a great family motto. And, it, and I think it speaks to that, it speaks to bravery and it speaks to courage, which is um, being a risk taker and not being afraid to fail because so we miss out on so many things when we, when we only allow ourselves the chance at things we know we are guaranteed success at. That's a really narrow, <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe there are no things we have guaranteed success at. So if we only try when we think we'll win, we're going to be sitting on the sidelines a lot. Amen to that. You know, courage is one of my favorite words. I used to wear it on my necklace because I, like you, it doesn't come naturally to me either. I've had to always practice it, always show up. I was painfully shy, didn't have confidence. So that word to me as well is just so important. And Maggie, I could talk to you forever, but I want to <laughs> end this with a question that I end all of my interviews on. So I'm going to ask you to fill in the blank. Okay. Are you ready for this? Okay. Fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So do the thing. I love that. That's simple and perfect and just summarizes what people should think about when they are living their lives. And Maggie, please tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and your wonderful book. Um, you can find me um, when I'm not in this office. <laughs> I'm on Twitter. <laughs> so you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm at Maggie Smith Poet so that I'm not confused with the dame. Um, I'm the other Maggie Smith. Um, and uh, the book Keep Moving is out from One Signal Press, Simon & Schuster. And uh, my last book of poems, Good Bones, is out from Tupelo Press. Um, and my website is maggiesmithpoet.com. So if you can, you can find me, you can also find the other Maggie Smith on the internet if that's interesting to you. <laughs> well, thank you. And we will make sure we link to the right Maggie Smith in all of the show notes for the show. Maggie, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. This has been great fun. Yay. Thank you, Maggie.